عمرہ در کابو بت خان امی نالد حیات تاز بزم عشق ایک دانا راز آیت بروں محترم حاضرین میں اب کلیدی خطبے کے لیے پروفیسر ضیاء الدین شکیب صاحب کو زحمت دے رہا ہوں کہ وہ آئیں اور کلیدی خطبہ فرمائیں آف پرزو اسلامک کلچر ایز اٹ اسٹارٹ ایکسٹینڈنگ ٹوورڈس دی ڈیکن فرام اے گریٹ ایونٹ نون ایز دی شفٹنگ آف دی کیپٹل فرام ڈیلی ٹو ڈیکن بائی سلطان محمد بن تغلق ان اباؤٹ تھرٹین ٹوینٹی سیون بائی دی اینڈ آف دی ففٹین سینچری پرزو اسلامک کلچر دیٹ اچیو دیٹ ارائیو فرام ڈیلی واز ناٹ ان اٹس پرسٹین ایرانین فارم اٹ ہیڈ آلریڈی ایسیمیلیٹیڈ اے گڈ ڈیل آف انڈین انفلوئنس لنگوسٹکلی اینڈ کلچرلی وائل وی اسپیک آف پرجین وائل وی اسپیک آف پرجین دیر ہیز آلویز بین اے کوشچن وائی دیر واز پرجین اینڈ وائی ناٹ این انڈین لینگویج دا کوشچن ساؤنڈس ٹف بٹ دی آنسر از سمپل دی آنسر از دیٹ انٹل دی برٹش راج واز اینفورسڈ لرننگ اینڈ ایجوکیشن ان انڈیا was restricted only to Brahmins. Aside from Muslims, no other Indians of a, of a caste lower than or other than the Brahmin has been, ha, had the access to literacy. In such a situation, Persian offered itself as a language open to one and all. Persian has been an idiom which for the first time paved the way for secular and mass education in India. This fact I shall try to explain a little bit more, specifically later on. However, the shifting of the capital by Muhammad bin Togla was an event in Indian history which changed the Deccan in many ways. This was a change in its demography, in its politics, and in its culture. Demographically, it was an influx, not only of the different castes of North Indian Hindus, but also of Muslims of Arab, Persian, Turkish, and Abyssinian origin. All of them either spoke Persian or Braj. Politically, there emerged a Bahmani kingdom with its first ruler, Alauddin Hassan Gangu, Alauddin Hassan Gangu Bahman Shah in 1347, I'm sorry for my weak eyesight, I have some problem, which lasted until the end of the 15th century. In almost a century and a half of Bahmani rule in the Deccan, there had been a huge influx of Sufis, poets, scholars who wrote in Persian language, administrators, architects, painters, calligraphers, and other sections of the Delhi elite. This was the beginning of a major change in the administrative system in the Deccan. The new system introduced a lot of paper administration, that too in Persian. A caste-ridden and class-bound society following the old age system introduced by Manu was for the first time exposed to the rule of law in criminal jurisdiction and the protection of personal law for all sects of the society. Though the basic village administration remained as it was, there developed a superstructure of a new administration, mostly with Muslims holding key positions. Among other new developments which the Deccan started to experience was the construction of highways, rapid urbanization of many areas, introduction of gardens and the development of lofty civil architecture. On the western side of the Deccan, a separate political unit gradually developed. This unit is known as Bijapur, whose importance has been emphasized by all historians of the Deccan, yet the geographical personality of Bijapur remains either scattered in scattered words or in crude cartography. The politics, the geopolitics of the area fluctuated frequently over the time. However, when we refer to Bijapur, we are referring to its largest territorial extent, which was obtained only by the time when it was about to break. 
Bijapur's geographical personality has many phases. The first phase is from 1347 to 1490. This was just a province of the Bahmani Empire. Then from 1492 to 1565, a period through which the Adil, Shahi, the Adil Shahis declared their autonomy and extended their territories by giving a setback to Vijayanagar at the Battle of Banihati. The next phase is from 1565 to 1619, when the Barith Shahis were overthrown by Bijapur and Bidar was annexed to Bijapur. It was a phase which broadly continued until the fall of Bijapur in 1686, a time when the king kingdom expanded in the south, so, uh, southmost realm of Karnataka. So this explains that the Bejapur's personal, physical personality was not very stable. It changed so, for so many times. So when we have to draw a map of Bejapur, it has to have lines showing its geopolitics as well. It is interesting to note that Dijapur was a multilingual state with Kannada and Marathi as major languages with marginal Telugu and Braj, which gradually developed into a new idiom known as Dakni. But the official language, Persian, was not only at the court, but throughout the state administration, except at village level, where the native languages of Kannada, Marathi, and Telugu prevailed and as the case might be. A close examination of the administrative documents of these languages reveal that the local idiom too had imbibed Persian quite a good deal. I had an opportunity to see a document written in Telugu, Telugu script, but more than 50% of it was loaded with Persian administrative terms and phraseology. As Persian was the only language open to all, it served the medium of instruction at all levels of education. The madrasas established by the Adil Shahs throughout their kingdom, they were run in Persian and they were open to one and all. That provided uh, opportunity to other communities, other, to communities other than Brahmins to learn Persian. And of course, if the Brahmins learned Persian, they were given special stipends. Persian being the language of elite, it became the major language of literary expression, both descriptive as well as creative. In the course of 200 years of history, of history Bijapur was ruled by nine monarchs. The first two rulers, Yusuf Adil Shah, and Ismail Adil Shah were Shias. The third, Mallu, <coughs> Mallu Adil Shah ruled just for a few months and is therefore negligible. The fourth, Ibrahim Adil Shah was a Sunni. The fifth, Ali Adil Shah, Adil Ali Adil Shah first was a Shia. Then the sixth, Ibrahim Adil Shah second, who, <coughs> is also known, uh, who is also known as Jagat Guru, was a Sunni. His son, Sultan Muhammad Adil Shah, was again a Sunni. The eighth and ninth, Ali Adil Shah II and Sikandar, and his son Sultan Sikandar Adil Shah were both Shias. The average span, the average span of the reigns of these sultans was about a quarter of a century each. If calculated, out of two centuries of Adil Shahi reign, a hundred years were covered by Shia rulers and another hundred years by the Sunnis, though intermittently. During the reigns of Shias, Iranians known as Afakis dominated the court and naturally Persian language and literature flourished, while during the reign of Sunni sultans, local Dakhnis and other native, native sections prospered, which resulted in a wonderful linguistic phenomena known as Dakhni. To dwell on Dakhni is beyond the scope of this seminar, but I am glad that there are some papers in this conference which are going to touch upon the Dekni idiom as well. Bejapur's contribution to Persian language and literature 
of course, is enormous and in many different disciplines, varying from pure literature, historiography, mystical experiences, lexicography, music, and sciences like astronomy and medicine. It is not <coughs> possible nor necessary to encompass all range of knowledge in this paper. As most of these areas are expected to be covered by the seminar, yet, <coughs> in the rem yet the remarkable contribution of Bijapur, one cannot avoid Tariq e Farishta of Muhammad Qasim bin Hindu Shah, known as Farishta, 1552 to 1620. Which is, a, which is perhaps only the Persian chronicle which covers the pre-Islamic history of the Deccan and records the history of the Deccan sultans until 1606. Among the literary, literary contributions of the most distinguished name is of Muhammad Zahuri. Died in 1615 particularly his Sakinama, his Divan, and his prose, Se Nasr Zuhuri, are such masterly works without which the history of Persian literature, at least in India, cannot be complete. The highly scholarly Persian lexicon recorded and compiled in Bijapur by Jamaluddin Mir Miran was, was ultimately attributed to Mughal Emperor Jahangir is now known as Ferengi Jahangiri. Mention may be made of Nujumul Ulum, a masterly book on astronomy written and illustrated in Bijapur around 1570 in the court of Adil Shah I, which is now preserved in the Chester Beatty Library, Dublin. Bijapur paintings are preserved in Salar Jang Museum, in the Jagdesh and Kamla Mittal Museum, Hyderabad, and in many other museums across the world. Sri Jagdish Mittal and Mark Zabrowski have made the foundational study of Vijapur school and opened new venues for further investigations. Similarly, Vijapur's calligraphy in manuscripts like Norris Nama and Gulshan Ish, both in Salarjing Library, and many masterly examples of calligraphy on paper, in stone, in wood, on metallic objects, and porcelain deserve a crit critical appreciation. Music, like other fine arts, was encouraged in Bijapur. There are works on this art written in Bijapur, and Norris Nama of Ibrahim Adil Shah II is an exceptional work related to music. Many of us have been to Bijapur and have seen the magnificent architectural monuments of Adil Shah, Adil Shahi period, especially Ibrahim Rauza and the mosque, Gol Gumbad, and Asar Mahal, where the sacred heir of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was brought to Bijapur during the reign of Ibrahim Adil Shah. These and many others have been summarily studied and await more rigorous scholarly investigation. It would be wonderful if a trip, of, trip to Bijapur is organized by the Department of Persian and the HK Sherwani Center for Deccan Studies for the students to stimulate their aspiration for further study. We look forward to receiving fascinating information about these aspects of Persian language and culture as it flourished in Bijapur during these three years of, uh, three days of the seminar for which I must again congratulate Malan Azad National University and its department of Persian. Thank you very much. <laughs>